Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure to talk to you about community ecology. It's the next level up from populations. It's basically when you have populations living close enough to one another, they're capable of interacting, and that's where the cool things start to emerge. When I say cool things, I mean the emergent properties that occur only when two populations can interact. They don't exist when you're just studying population. And let me give you an example of this by uh, beginning our conversation. Of course, I'm going to give you an example of the redwood forest. And here you can see a beautiful redwood forest in a stream going by. And the thing about this is there's a relationship because there's a community here. There's, there's fish living in the stream. There's salmon and trout. And there's some trees and some shrubs living along the side, some ferns. As it turns out, because of the fact the forest is here, it prevents erosion when it rains. And therefore, a lot of sediment doesn't go inside of the, the creek. And so, as a result of that, the salmon eggs are able to not be smothered as a result of that. And so, it helps uh, the salmon survive. And so, another interesting quality is that the forest is sometimes so dense that it actually blocks a lot of the sunlight that travels down into these creeks and it keeps the water really cool. And it may not seem like a big deal, but it is because colder water will hold more oxygen. And as it turns out, sometimes a tree will fall and it'll actually block up the stream. And as a result of blocking up the stream, it'll cause pools to form. And those pools are perfect habitat for salmon, especially the juveniles, to be able to live in those pools and, and also hide from predators. And so, as it turns out, you know, what, what does the salmon and the trout provide? Well, you know, in the end, when they, when they die, those nutrients will then be able to get back into the forest and help to recycle. And so it's, this is what we're talking about. Community is a really cool uh, notion of ecology because it talks about different interspecific, interspecific interactions. And so we're talking about interactions between different species. For example, the classic between the clownfish and the sea anemone. And so that type of relationship is a symbiotic relationship. But we also want to talk about competition because that can occur between two different species. And competition only occurs when species are close enough to interact. And then predation, likewise, is only emerges when two populations are close enough to interact. And then symbiosis, of course. And so we're going to look at these three uh, community interactions and all of those are biotic interactions and that is between living organisms and so let's talk about competition now I know you have background in competition most people know what competition is it's basically a struggle for a particular resource it doesn't necessarily mean that the resource is in short supply but it could but it's just fighting over the same resource and so what are some resources that organisms compete over uh, Principally, sunlight is one if you're a plant, but it could be things like food, it could be territory, it could be mate, habitat, these sorts of things. And so anything that you're, you really need to survive, if someone else wants it, there's going to be a fight. And so we have interspecific competition, that, it, that means between two different species. And so these are some things that I mentioned before about what could cause competition. And here's a male lion sort of scaring off a hyena and... and looks like the African savanna. And so this is what something's called interspecific interference competition. So they might be fighting over maybe a carcass or something like that. They're competing over those food scraps. And so since competition's been around for a long time in biology, it's one of the more easier, although very interesting, concepts that we can experiment on. And so there were some experiments on competition that were done long ago, many decades ago, like even back in the 1930s, there was a Russian scientist that was working with this protozoan called paramecium. It's a single-celled organism and it moves along by the cilia. Now you could culture, in other words, grow them in a little dish like this, a little petri dish, and you can grow them up. And, and when I say grow them up, what I mean by that is you could see like when you put some food in there and some water, they need water. What will happen is in the paramecium, do you recall this when we were talking about population growth, you could expect their population 
to grow slowly and then it'll grow exponentially and then it'll eventually reach a caring capacity. And that's, that's what actually happens. But that wasn't what the experiment was all about. The experiment was what would happen if you took two different species that were very similar and they, and they liked the same resources. What would happen if you put both of them together? They might start fighting inside this Petri dish. And so this is what happened. And so as it turns out, the Russian scientist that was working on this, pretty famous, was G.F. Gauss. And so he's working with paramecium, and this is the P for paramecium. It's the genus name. And there's two different species. We'll just say it's the blue one and the, and the red one. And as it turns out, when you grow them separately in two different dishes, like I showed you before, they both show that sort of logistic growth. They grow and then they reach a carrying capacity. So this is what, what you would expect. But then when you put these two different paramecians into the same, so you're growing them a mixed culture, so in the same dish, this is what happens. It looks like the blue one is able to do very well and that the red one doesn't do very well. And so this is what we like to call, and Gauss came up with this, the competitive exclusion principle. Competitive exclusion principle. And, that, and that's kind of an obvious thing. It just means that one species is outcompeting the other one to its exclusion, to its demise. Now, that's pretty dramatic. That means that competition, the result of competition is that there's a winner and a loser. It's pretty, pretty brutal. Because in biology, losing could mean dying. And so this is, again, another another picture of the same thing. So you grow them separately, and then when you grow them together, this one dominates over this one. And so this is this species is being excluded. But what's a little weird about this is that you're like, wow, every time these two species are together, they're going to be competing with one another, and I guess this one's going to die, and it's a competitive exclusion pr principle. But the truth is, when you actually look at some pond water or a lake, and you actually are able to like pull some water out, look at these paramecium under the microscope, you're like, wait a minute, uh, these two different species are actually in the same lake. When, you know, what's going on? I thought, I thought they were supposed to compete and this one's supposed to dominate over that one. So as it turns out, something's kind of interesting because apparently they don't have to compete. Now, what do I mean by that? That means that when organisms are in competition with one another, they've got to avoid it. And so let me see if I can diagram that. So in other words, if you just think about it like this, like this, if this is species A and this is species B, where, where they overlap right here is where the competition is going to occur. And it's like, well, what are they fighting over? It could be food, it could be space, it could be anything, it could be a mate. So the idea is to sort of spread out <laughs> to make sure that you're not in direct competition with another organism. And so this brings up the concept of ecological niche, or sometimes it's pronounced ecological niche. And so it's really not just where an organism lives, but it's everything. It's the food that it's eating, the, uh, the time of day that it's feeding, the types of um, courtship rituals it performs, it's the habitat, it's all of the things that an organism does to get along. And so the idea is if two, or, if two species, watch this, if, this, if I were to move this over, let me do that. If I actually said, uh, what happened when the paramecium occupied the same niche? In other words, like this, A and B were really overlapping with one another. That's not good. One of them's going to outcompete the other one, and that's called competitive exclusion. So one way to prevent that is to now this is just sort of graphically you want to occupy a different niche, and if you occupy a different niche, then there won't be any overlap and you can survive. So here's a real example of this: like there's these birds that will live in the same tree. These are different species of bird. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Birds, they're all pretty similar. They're probably going to be competing over something. Well, in fact, it turns out that they're not because if they were, there'd be trouble for the loser. So this particular bird is living high up in the tree and this one's occupying this area and this one's in, this one's in the middle and this one's on the bottom. So not only are they living in different habitats in the same tree, 
They could even be doing other things that are different too. They may be feeding at different times of day. They could be eating different things. This one could be eating like seeds up here. This one could be eating worms or insects on the ground. And so this is what we mean by occupying a different niche. They're doing things differently to avoid competition. And so these, these were wobbler birds. And so as it turns out, this is a famous ecological study showing that even within a same tree that birds can coexist and they're not competing with one another because they're occupying different niches. And so it doesn't have to be just birds. It could be, well, this happens to be a, also an example of a bird. But you could have birds, for example, not competing with one another. And you can like, well, why not? Well, they're, do you notice here that they're eating different things? Some are eating some shells and some are eating some worms. And maybe what's preventing that is the fact that the beaks themselves are adapted to eating at a shallow depth and some of the beaks are adapted at eating at like deeper and so therefore the birds can actually coexist in the same area and so we see this a lot especially in areas like the rainforest where there's just an incredible amount of insects and bugs and birds and you're like boy and frogs how can all that i'm sure they're all fighting and competing but in fact they're not because the competitive exclusion principle would, wouldn't allow it. So therefore, they're all occupying different niches. And so it's incredible that this is going on, I think. It's very interesting. And so the ecological niche, again, just to sort of define it to make sure, it's the sum of all the organisms' uh, uses of both the biotic resources and abiotic resources of the environment. It's everything an organism does. And so the competitive exclusion principle, if you were to restate it, would be that no two organisms can occupy the same niche. See, if they occupy the same niche, then there's going to be competition and one's not going to be able to make it. And so the concept of niche is a fascinating one. If we, if we pull it out and draw it out and, and look at this even more, you can think, well, in terms of a niche, there's something called a realized niche and something called a fundamental niche. And so a realized niche is the space an organism actually occupies versus what is it best adapted to fundamentally? What can it do? And so what's interesting about this is that sometimes it's difficult to know what an organism's niche is because other organisms are putting a constraint on it. Like for example, let me just come back to this for a, sec for a second. So you might be thinking, well, Cape May might really enjoy being up here on the top of the tree. And you're like, well, this is its niche. This is where it likes. Well, the truth is, if it had the whole tree to itself, in other words, these other birds weren't here, it might be flying all over the tree. It could be like eating up here. It could be eating it could be doing all sorts of things. And so as it turns out, where we actually see an organism, when we actually study what it eats or what it does or its behavior, this is, this is its realized niche, but fundamentally, it's capable of doing other things. See, so it's kind of tricky. And so check this out. Back over here with the squirrel. This is a little tiny red squirrel. And now it turns out that it, you know, I'll just th read this. The red squirrels may be able to survive where there's enough cones, conifers, for them to provide for food. But as it turns out, when there's these large gray squirrels that I think most of us are familiar with, it prevents the red squirrel from living in a particular area because it's, it's out competing it. And so it's an interesting thing, like they have to avoid each other. And so here's another example. In the ocean, in the, in the intertidal zone, you get these shelled creatures called barnacles. And a barnacle has the shell. We often, don't, we often see the shell, but we don't see the animal that lives within inside. And so here it is. It has this sort of fan-like tentacle network that comes out and what it does is it comes out like this and it filter feeds a little tiny uh, zooplankton and phytoplankton from the water and so this is what it's able to to eat now it likes being in the water because that's where it gets its oxygen this is where it gets its food this is where it doesn't dry out and so here's the deal like when you live high up on the rock you're pushing it because there's a chance that you could dry out or desiccate, especially when the sun's bearing down on you and you're like, this is not a good neighborhood. Some barnacles can tolerate it, 
but it's certainly not a good neighborhood. This is a good neighborhood. Look at this right here. This blue one, it's love and life. It's close to the water, low tide, high tide. It's, it's, it's really, it's got the perfect location. So here's, here's the question, you know, is this its fundamental niche or its realized niche? Is this the fundamental niche or the realized niche? And you're like, well, it's difficult to know because they're next to each other. And, you, and we really don't know what the sort of competition is or what the interaction is. So you're like, well, we'll never know. Well, <laughs> this is the thing about the tide pool. Like you can manipulate the tide pool. Like you could find another tide pool where there's just one barnacle living. And then you could sort of see what it's capable of doing fundamentally. Or you could actually sort of, though difficult, you could actually remove some of these organisms and see what's happening. And so check this out. So here's the original uh, situation where you have the blue and, and the brown barnacles. Now, what I was mentioning before is a removal. So if you went out there and removed the blue barnacles, ha ha, as it turns out, the brown barnacle does like to live close to the water. So this right here, let me sort of do this. This is the brown barnacles fundamental niche. It's its fundamental niche. This is what it's fundamentally capable of doing. This is its realized niche. And so as a result of knowing this, we know that the blue barnacle was out competing it. And so if this is, if this species right here is more competitive, then we have to say to ourselves, guess what? Even when they're together, this is its fundamental niche and its realized niche. But the brown is capable of living on the on, on the whole rock as it turns out. And so the blue barnacle is fundamental and realized niche here in blue are the same. And then the brown barnacle, this is its uh, realized niche, but its fundamental niche is all the way down a little bit lower. It's kind of interesting. So I was mentioning rainforest, it, but it, it doesn't have to be rainforest. So I just mentioned it because it's such a... Uh, an area where it's so, so rich with different species that there's a tendency that uh, niches might get overlapped. And so as it turns out, every little space is important. It's sort of like, if you think about it in your kitchen, it's sometimes there's limited space. And so you have shelves and you put like glasses on one and dishes on the other and maybe a water pitchers on the other. And so you have these little shelvings, which you're you're basically partitioning, or in your locker, you're partitioning your resources. And so think of it this way. Like, for example, even like lizards, like even though they're living in the same area and you're like, oh no, okay, so these are all the same genus, which is A, and these are all different species. And you're like, how could they all coexist? I'm sure they're gonna be competing, but they don't because they're partitioning their resources. Some are up here, think of it like shelving. Some, they might be eating something different or doing something different to avoid each other. And so as it turns out, some are down here, some are up here, but they occupy different niches. So when species find themselves sort of vying for the same niche, uh, one's going to do well and the other one's not. And so what's going to happen is one's going to become extinct. And so they have to sort of, you know, make room for each other. And so this is what we call resource partitioning. And so this is a really cool concept and it's very common in life. So even if you had two different, uh, these are birds called finches. These are pretty famous from Darwin, uh, investigated these on the Galapagos Islands. And so if you have two uh, finch species that are in competition for the same medium sized seed eating niche, this, this is not gonna be good. There's gonna be competition. One's gonna win, one's gonna live lose. So as it turns out, maybe the ones that were fighting did die off. But then as it turns out, since there's variation in a population, let me see if I can overlap this. It may seem ridiculous, but I'm going to do it anyway, like this. So, okay. Let's just say this is the number of birds. And this is the trait right here of beak. Okay. And so these, this is the, the tiny beak, this is the giganto beak, and this is the medium-sized beak right in here. So if the birds are competing over here for these sort of medium-sized things, uh, nuts, then what's going to happen is 
these organisms are not going to use a different color. These ones are going to be dying off <clears throat> because they don't have enough food. And if they're dying off, then they're probably not going to reproduce. And heredity will suggest that there's not going to be a lot of medium ones. And as it turns out, these ones over here, over time, not the same bird, but their children, there's going to be a lot of these small beak ones. <clears throat> and then a lot of large ones like this. And so you get sort of this little valley thing happening. <coughs> Excuse me. So you're like, is this really happening? This, this really can happen. And so this is a, a study that was done on the Galapagos Islands, which is a archipelago chain that's about 1,500 kilometers west in the Pacific Ocean of, of this uh, country of Ecuador in South America. These are different islands. This is Santa Maria, this is Daphne, and this is Los Hermanos. And as it turns out, this idea is called character displacement. <clears throat> and so there's a tendency for characteristics to become divergent meaning when I say divergent, it means that it's splitting up like this. In other words, like tiny beak and big beak, they're, they're diverging as it, as it uh, over time. And so let me sort of explain what this is about. On the island of Santa Maria, now as it turns out, these birds live together on this island. These birds live together. And so as a result, the competition is occurring in the middle and so those don't survive very well. So you get the small beak and you get the large beak. This means sympatric, which means they're living in the same homeland. So they live in the same island. But check this out. This species right over here, when it lives on an island all by itself, eh, there's no pressure on it. And so it, it tends to have medium sized beak. How about that? And then this guy over here, when it lives by itself on an, on an island, it tends to also have medium-sized beak. Interesting. So you put them together, and it's as if you know, they're, they're fighting with one another, and the losers in the middle break off, and then you get character displacement. And it's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. And say, okay, so that ends our conversation about competition. So we'll move on to the biotic interaction of predation. Again, predation is pretty straightforward, and most people understand this, that a predator eats a prey. And what was once uh, prey could, could also be a predator. And so it invokes things like the food chain and the food web. And so as it turns out, what you get here is something called an herbivore. An herbivore is something that is an organism that eats plants. We also can call an herbivore a primary, which means number one, primary consumer. That means that they're vegetarian. They're eating the plants. And the plants are considered to be autotrophic because they're making their own food through photosynthesis. And so as it turns out, you know, the deer is eating the grass. So here's the herbivore. Here's the, here's the producer. But as it turns out, you know, plants are not totally defenseless. They're, they're prey, but they do have their ways of, of defending themselves against herbivores both mechanically and chemically. You might be familiar with some of these plant defenses. One of the most famous ones is the fact that plants can produce uh, some pretty brutal chemicals. Like for example, this is a picture of poison oak. Now this would certainly prevent a deer from eating it. <laughs> so that's good defense. And then there's mechanical ones like thorns. That will also prevent herbivores from eating it. Now animals have defense as well against predators. And so they're sort of behavioral ones. You know, the, the truth is, if you can get away, uh, that's a great defense. And so you could literally like run away and flee or, or basically hide. That's a great form of defense as well. But, you know, you could, you could fight self-defense or you can form like a mob. And that sort of prevents a predator from tracking you down individually. But I would say number one, if I were an animal and a predator was coming, hiding would be number one for me. Because if you try to run, you're, you might get caught. But if you're hiding, you may not even be noticed. You don't have to fight. But if you hide, you've got to be camouflaged. And so that's pretty important. And so this brings up the whole notion of camouflage or, if you will, cryptic, which is hidden, cryptic coloration. And so check this out. I don't know if you could even notice it, but this is a what's called a leafy sea dragon. Now. It's a type of seahorse, but look at this. It look, 
look at the incredible, this is an animal, but it looks a lot like the kelp fronds that are behind it. This is a tremendous example of camouflage, which prevents this uh, seahorse from being eaten. I have to show you this. Speaking of camouflage, I'm going to come over here. Another example of seahorse. Seahorse can take on all these different looks. Let me come on over here for a second. Now take a look at this. Now I was telling you that a seahorse could look like kelp, but now look at this one. Look at these seahorse. I mean, isn't this incredible? I mean, look at this. This is an animal, but it looks incredibly like the coral that it's living in. And so that's I find that to be completely remarkable. So there's many examples of really interesting uh, types of camouflage. And so if you wanted, you could search that and look at different types of cryptic coloration. Now, another type of animal defense is not being secretive or not being camouflage or cryptic, but rather being somewhat conspicuous. And so this brings up the whole idea of deceptive, which is sort of misleading markings. Deceptive. What's that? Well, this moth, look at this moth. It has like these big spots on here. Now, where did it get these spots? It could just be some random mutation that, cr that, that created this at first, but natural selection sort of drove it into this. This these whoops, these look like eyes, if you ask me. And I don't know, if if I'm a bird and I'm trying to eat this moth, I might get freaked out by that. I might think it's a some brutal owl or something like that. Or a lot of fish have these big spots on it that sort of look like an eye spot. And so when a predator's coming, it can sort of put the juke on it and sort of swim in different directions. So deceptive markings. And then you have good old, like, plants have thorns. Animals have defensive mechanisms as well, like spines on, the, on a porcupine. No one's going to mess with the porcupine as a result of that. That's, so that's a great animal defense. Now look at this defense. Now, it's like, well... Looking this bright is uh, pretty dangerous because obviously this is going to attract attention. And so this is extremely conspicuous. This is called um, aposomatic, probably mispronouncing it, but aposomatic coloration or conspicuous coloration. What is it? Well, it's a way in which you can sort of advertise the fact that you're producing some kind of poison or toxin. If you could do that, you can you can back down your predator and intimidate them so that they don't even attempt to eat you. And so sometimes this uh, conspicuous coloration is sort of coupled with some some other sort of chemical defense that you're being that you're producing. Like for example, a skunk. Like a skunk doesn't always have to release its smell. Just simply looking over and seeing like that white stripe down its back, and you're like, ah, it's a skunk. And then it doesn't even release. And so it's intimidating you with its conspicuous marking. Same thing like with a with a bee or a wasp. <laughs> it doesn't have to sting you. It, it intimidates you and backs you down. <laughs> and so look at this. Even these little guys, like those frogs were pretty small. This newt's even smaller still. And look at this. It's pretty conspicuous. It stands out bright red, the red spotted newt, but it's poisonous. And like kind of an interesting thing. I don't know if you recall this in your studies of biology somewhere in your past, but there's a story about salamanders that have been migrating from Oregon down into California. Not the same salamander, but different generations and generations. Maybe even for a million years, they've been migrating down into California. And as it turns out, some of them went down the coast and some of them went down the Sierras. So they were separated, something called a ring species. And so as it turns out, Habitat's different on over here in Monterey than it is over here in the Sierras. And as it turns out, some of these salamanders are kind of orange in coloration, like, th like this guy. And it's like, well, that's weird. And so when a scientist studies the salamander, they're like, I wonder if it has some kind of poison since it's so conspicuous. As it turns out, it doesn't. It has no poison at all. And you're like, well, wait a minute. It's going to get eaten. Well, no one messes with that salamander because the predator thinks it's one of these poisonous newts. And so when one species resembles another one, we call that mimicry. Isn't that interesting? Well, now this over here, this sort of blackish one with, with yellow spots, this is not mimicry. This is just simply camouflage. So you got camouflage, 
happening over here and you got some mimicry happening over here. So speaking of mimicry, I mentioned that mimicry is when organisms resemble another species. And so one of the very first naturalists is sort of a contemporary of Charles Darwin. Uh, one of the first naturalists to describe mimicry was, uh, was Bates. So it was Hen Henry Walter Bates in the 1800s. And so we, we still honor him by giving him this namesake here. So it's Batesian mimicry. It's when one species, here's a caterpillar, that's sort of harmless, sort of like that salamander, mimics or resembles one that is harmful. Like, for example, this caterpillar looks a lot like the head of a snake, and so maybe birds aren't going to mess with it as a result of that. And so what's significant, just a little side down here, about Bates is that he was a, an English explorer, like a lot of these naturalists were uh, during this time, and he actually was in the Amazon rainforest with Alfred Russell Wallace. That's pretty, pretty cool, too, because you might recognize that name. Alfred Russell Wallace was um, an individual that um, sort of co-thought of the theory of natural selection along with Charles Darwin. And so here's a great example of Batesian mimicry. Here you have this dangerous coral snake with these stripes. Now, not only is it poisonous, but it's packing some uh, some warning coloration as well. So if you saw the coral snake, what are you going to do? And then what happens if you saw this snake? What are you going to do? <laughs> maybe maybe the answer is run no matter what. It's, I don't know. Maybe we're intimidated by snakes, perhaps. But as it turns out, the king snake is not poisonous, but yet it mimics or resembles the coral snake, and so therefore it's protected as a result of it. Birds aren't likely to want to attack it. And so, as it turns out, there's another interesting story that goes along with this, that this Batesian mimicry only seems to work when the two different species are occupying the same range. Apparently, the, the model has to establish the precedent, and then the mimic benefits from that. But if King Snake is all by himself, and there's no coral around, and you're just striped, <laughs> you're, and you have no poison, you're in trouble. So there you go. And so this is another, sorry for multiple examples, but they're also very interesting. Um, this is a classic example of Batesian mimicry, and it's the uh, monarch butterfly. Now, see that beautiful butterfly right there? And so biologists were stymied by this because birds wouldn't eat it. And so, of course, they're not eating it because there's probably some sort of distasteful chemical that it's producing. But as it turns out that when you grow these guys up in the lab, uh, and you put them in a cage and you put some birds in there, they eat them all up. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Birds are not eating the monarch butterfly in nature. What's going on? So as it turns out, they eat a lot of this plant milkweed. And when they eat a lot of this milkweed, there's sort of, sort of some bitter chemicals in this that actually make the butterfly itself uh, not very palatable. In other words, distasteful. So it's sort of like, like eating a lot of garlic. It's, it's giving you bad breath. And so that's the, when birds see this monarch butterfly, they're like, nah, I'm not going to eat that. But here's the mimic. The viceroy butterfly resembles the monarch butterfly, and it tastes great. And so it doesn't get eaten as a result of it. Now, there's a second kind of mimicry. It's, uh, again, probably mispronouncing it, but Mullerian mimicry. And this is something where two species are both producing some sort of poison or some sort of toxin, but they resemble each other in order to reinforce. So there's a mimicry between two species to reinforce the message to the predator that they're not to be messed with. Now that's different than Batesian because Batesian was one's poisonous, one's not. But this is two troublesome guys that resemble each other. Like for example, Bees and wasps are an example of this. So they were able to reinforce it. And so one of the last community interactions that we're going to talk about is symbiosis. And that's a symbiosis relationship is living together. And so not all living relationships are good. Now, again, a person on the street, if you use the word symbiosis, they're like, oh, symbiosis, where... Both species are benefiting from one another. But the truth is, uh, 
that is one type of symbiosis and I'm going to use a plus for being beneficial. Yes, one species benefits from the relationship, the other one benefits. But you could have one benefiting and one doesn't seem to have any effect at all. And then there's another relationship in symbiosis where one benefits and the other one is harmed. So there's three different types of symbiosis that I want to talk about, but it's living together in a relationship. And so classic example of this is the clownfish and the sea anemone. So the three types of symbiosis are parasitism, commensalism, and mutualism. And so let me come back with those pluses and minuses. Parasitism, parasitism is where one benefits, which is the parasite, and the negative is the host. You can think of like a mosquito and, and maybe you. Commensalism, one benefits and the other one doesn't seem to have any effect whatsoever. And mutualism is when they both benefit. There's always an ongoing debate about the clown and the anatomy of whether or not it's commensalism or mutualism. I kind of fall under the camp of mutualism. I think the fact that the clownfish is so conspicuous and so, so beautiful, it's attracting other predators to, an, to, to the anemone, and then the anemone gets to eat that. And as a result, the clownfish gets protection from the anemone. And so I think it's kind of a mutualistic relationship, but it's debatable. Now, parasites, these are not our favorite <laughs> organisms, things like ticks, uh, mosquitoes, uh, worms. Um, these are all tapeworms. These are all troublesome individuals <laughs> that uh, devise nourishment from the host and the host is harmed in the process. Now it isn't taking it, it's a matter of, uh, of degree. Oftentimes the parasite doesn't destroy the host, doesn't kill it because then you'd cross over perhaps into predation. This is where it's sort of just using it and, and harming it slowly. And so the other two uh, examples of symbiosis is one of the, the classic examples of mutualism is the relationship that bees have with flowers. In other words, flowering plants and their pollinators. Now, bees obviously get nectar, which they sugar, which they like from a flower, and then the flower benefits from the bee traveling from flower to fla flower, uh, transmitting its the pollen in, in the process of pollination. Then you have commensalism. I like this example. It's where a bird is having a nice home inside of a tree and building its nest and raising its children. And it's, it's just loving it, living in the tree. And the tree doesn't seem to mind. And so it's a great example of one benefits and the other one has no effect whatsoever. And another example of that would be like barnacles. Remember I talked about the ones that come out and filter feed. If they live on a whale, Boy, that's, that's love in life. When the whale's swimming around, they get to get all that food. And it doesn't seem to harm the whale. Here's an example of a uh, manta ray. And there's these fish that like to swim right next to the manta ray, sometimes even like literally on its body. This is somewhat, again, debatable. I, would, I fall into the camp of thinking that this is commensalism because they're not in any way harming the manta ray and they seem to benefit from getting some scraps left over when the manta ray eats. One could say that maybe that is harmful because it's it's eating a little bit of the food of the manta ray. So this could be commensalism. Sometimes birds will get will be on the back of of cattle and they could pick parasites off the back. And so that benefits the cattle and, and the bird also gets food. So this could be an example of mutualism. But then again, here's a different relationship between cattle and these beautiful birds called egrets. Sometimes these don't pick parasites off, but rather they just sort of walk alongside the cattle. And as the cattle walks by, it kicks up bugs in, in the grass and the egret gets to eat. And so that's beneficial to the egret, but the cow doesn't seem to mind. And so I don't know if you recall this example, the longhorn beetle. Uh, has a symbiotic relationship with the redwood tree. You know, like that's kind of an odd pairing. But as it turns out, the beetle lays its eggs in the cone. And when the larva, this is not in the cone, but I found this picture here of the, of the longhorn beetle larva. 
it sort of bores a hole in the cone when it grows up and which dislodges the seeds, which helps the redwood to be able to grow <laughs> and reproduce. And so it's an example of mutualism. How do you like that? Like a little tiny beetle and a giant redwood tree. There's, there's a nice couple. <laughs> and so um, lastly, I want to talk about when you get species living close enough together, sometimes we like to think of natural selection as always being uh, the moth is camouflaged on the tree. And so it has a certain look about it based on something or, or it's camouflaged based on the rock. And, and so we always think of natural selection as being uh, the, the selective pressure on an organism is something abiotic, something physical. But in fact, when organisms live close enough to one another, and that's what we're talking about in communities, sometimes the associations that occur between the organisms help selection along. And so that both organisms co-evolve because of the presence of the other. It, it's one of the great concepts of all in biology, co-evolution. It's the reciprocal evolutionary adaptation between organisms and how they both exert selective pressures on one another. It's, it's really, really interesting. And so one of the great examples that I can think of for this is this tropical plant called the acacia. And as it turns out, it's sometimes called the thorn acacia, and it has these big hollow thorns. And what's interesting is that this plant doesn't really get eaten by any, any predators, any herbivores, and it's kind of curious why they wouldn't. And as it turns out, there's a lot of ants crawling around the acacia. And as it turns out, it's, it's just this great match between plants and insects, but it's not ha having to do with pollination. And so in Central America, this acacia species has these hollow thorns. And as it turns out, they make like really nice homes for the ant. And there's like little sugary nectars inside. And so it, the ants benefit from living in the acacia. And you're like, okay, so what of that? Well, as a result, what the ants do is that they protect they come out and so if there's a bug even a big one that's trying to eat the acacia the ants just simply go berserk they're like little police security guards they're like what somebody's attacking mother acacia so they all come out like an army and they start uh, eating it <laughs> or at least shooing it away and so you got to think that the acacia wouldn't have created these hollow thorns with the sugar if it wasn't in response to the ants and they and again uh it's a fascinating example of how two different species are um, living in the same area. And not only are they, is there a community interaction, but a co-evolutionary one as well. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation of community interactions and introduction to communities. Thanks for watching.